faith and it's good by despair for there's power so much power there's power Tonight, I endeavor to present to you just a few aspects of the miracle of prayer. Uh, there is not time sufficient to discuss it in its entirety. When we as Christians pray, we're not just praying to some lifeless carved idol or some foreign cosmic spectator. We're praying to Almighty God one who is able to make a way where there seems not to be a way, the one who has power to destroy, create, cast into hell, or convict towards salvation. We're not praying to Baal, Satan, Buddha, trees, Mother Earth, Baphomet, a forest spirit, demons, or the dead. What I'm talking about, what privilege we have set before us, is prayer to not just a powerful being, but the most powerful being there is, whose presence cannot be contained by the futile expanse of space and time, even as space and time continue to grow. I'm talking about the one who has the power to decimate Sodom and Gomorrah for their sins, and yet can show individual compassion for a ruthless criminal hanging on a Roman cross. We have the opportunity to converse with the Creator and Master of Heaven, the Builder and Architect of Earth, the Designer and Producer of every living creature, the Great Physician who does not practice but has perfected medicine, the Wonderful Counselor, whose wisdom extends beyond what mortal man could ever understand, the Loving Father who did not spare his son, but allowed the ultimate sacrifice that you and I could be set free from the bonds of sin, that we might rejoice, be clothed in his righteousness, and have a purpose in the kingdom of God. That's the God I serve. I tell you, we need to get excited about prayer. We need to get excited about reading the scriptures. We need to get excited about attending church. We need to get excited about our salvation. The devil will do what he can to keep you from these things because there is power in them. The adversary does not want you to have power. He wants you to be weak so he can take what authority you give him and make a mockery of you. Just like Job and Paul had to suffer tremendous losses and maladies in their lives, Satan will do his best to wear you down and make you abandon the faith. But remember... Job and Paul did not waver in their faith, and they reaped a greater glory afterwards than they had ever known prior. Job's wealth was returned to him in his lifetime, even with even more than at first. Paul suffered a martyr's beheading under the order of Nero, Claudius, Caesar, Augustus, Germanicus but he reaped the eternal glory of eternally living in the presence of the Beautiful One. The devil sent so many trials and tribulations in Paul's direction because Paul was an effectual in spreading the gospel message to the Gentile world. Hearts of humanity were being set ablaze with the good news of Jesus' salvation. He was setting the world on fire for Christ. Along with that, the devil found out that prison wouldn't slow this preacher down either. If he wasn't preaching to everyone in earshot of him, praying or praising God in the muck and the mire, Paul was writing letters to the churches which would endure as the very inspiration of God, even unto this day. Paul was excited about his relationship with the Lord, and he was a man devoted to to prayer. I don't think we realize sometimes just what a miracle prayer actually is. 
Prayer is not simply some ritual set of phrases that unlocks some random mystical power. Prayer is not just ranting to God about your woes either. Prayer is an ongoing conversation. It goes across topics, and the center topic is ultimately God. Prayer transcends distance beyond light years that no man could fathom. Humanity has used the intricacies of technology to explore the nearby expanse of space, only to find that it is nearly endless. We cannot find the outer edges of what currently is, and even in the endless documentation, the ceaseless photos that have been acquired through modern space telescopes, man has yet to physically find the realms of God's abode. We're talking about places we can see, but could never hope to reach. As of 2020, the University of Tokyo determined that the farthest detectable galaxy is GN-Z11, a galaxy only one twenty-fifth the size of the Milky Way galaxy, GN-Z11 is estimated to be approximately 32 billion light-years away from us. In cosmology, the speed of light in a vacuum is 186,000 miles per second, or 671 million miles per hour. If you were traveling at the speed of light, you could walk to the moon in less than two seconds. It would take just over eight minutes, if you want to walk out to the sun. That means, if you were traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, it would take you 32 billion years. To get to the farthest place we can currently estimate. And remember, they have not found the gates of heaven yet. I personally believe heaven is present in a separate dimension, whose portals are accessible to the spirit and soul. Nonetheless, the power of prayer goes beyond the power of astronomical technology. Prayer makes its way to the celestial city, directly into the courts of the Almighty, at the very moment you utter the words. There is no cell phone lag caused by interrupted satellite transmission, nor is there a telephone line broken somewhere in the mountains. God hears your prayers, and God still answers prayers. What a miracle we have within our grasp to be able to pray to the Lord. Some people endeavor that God will not hear a sinner's prayer. That is a lie from the pit of hell. If God won't hear a sinner's prayer, then whose prayer will he hear? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All our righteousness is as filthy rags. When Jesus told of the Pharisee and the tax collector praying at the temple, the tax collector humbled himself before God and admitted he was a sinner. And Jesus said that sinner was the one justified in that prayer meeting. God cares for you, and he hears your prayers. Accomplishing salvation in the heart and life of man is the greatest miracle that could ever be bestowed upon us, and it's something only God could ever wrought. The convicting power of the Holy Ghost, the hound of heaven, drawing us to the end of ourselves that we might see the truth of the depravity we live in. Then when we are able to visualize what wretchedness and corruption we exist as, the Holy Ghost turns our gaze to the Roman cross on Golgotha's hill, a place where the greatest miracle of all time transpired some 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ, the chosen Messiah of the Hebrew nation, of the bloodline of the chosen Jewish King David, Jesus the miracle worker, Jesus the Son of the living God, Jesus 
the incarnate God in the flesh, Jesus, the perfect, sinless, spotless Lamb of God, was crucified there. He paid the ultimate sacrifice. He died on Calvary's tree. He was murdered by the sins of humanity. But more than that, he freely gave up his life in obedience to the will of God the Father that sin might no longer rule and reign over us, but that we would become the righteousness of God, that we might be called children of the Most High, that we might enter into the kingdom of God and praise God throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. If that doesn't get you stirred up, then friend, you must not have what I have. It's something to be excited about. It's the truth that sets you free. And it's the spirit of life. The adversary will do whatever he can to make you weak, and he knows more than anyone else that a prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. That is, if you can even call him a Christian at all. I have some advice for you here. Don't want to pray? Do it anyway. Crucify the flesh. It is not your spirit that drives you away from prayer. The spirit of God is always willing to do what is right, and putting matters into God's hand is always the right thing to do. The flesh, this remnant of carnality, the earthly vessels we continue our earthly journey in, that is the part that wills to do what is wrong, what is pleasurable, what is temporarily satiating, yet never satisfies the soul. The flesh says eat, play, kick up your heels, Enjoy luxury. Have fun. You only live once. But the word of God says fast, pray, study to show yourself approved. The soul of man never dies. There is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. God gave man a free will and a consciousness. These are perhaps some of the greatest gifts and most terrible curses in all of creation. A free will means we have the power and authority to do as we choose. This is part of what makes man so unique. We can choose what we will accomplish. Consciousness refers to being aware of our surroundings, sensitive to our environment. This coupled with a free will allows for the diversity we see in cultures, the differences in personalities, the distinctions in how we approach issues, and the distinctness in forms of architecture, music, art, sports, and so on. A lie the devil started on this earth some 6,000 years ago is this. You have the freedom to do whatever you want. That is wrong. The sea does not have that much power. It is hemmed in by the mountains and the shores. Not even the stars have that much freedom. They themselves are hemmed in by the hands of God. I do not possess freedom so that I can freely choose my gender or freely have sex with every living creature that comes my way, freely murder a baby in the womb or freely cuss people out because of their religion. I do not possess freedom so that I can freely burn down the city, freely rob the bank, or freely assassinate anyone I don't like. I do not possess freedom that I can freely lure children into the sex trade, freely assassinate the elderly under the guise of medical research, freely manipulate masses to exterminate what I would consider an inferior sect of humanity, or freely run around in society stark naked. I don't even have the freedom to mandate a vaccine for medical purposes. 
And I believe our government is on the cusp of realizing this overreach the American people are becoming intolerant of. All choices have consequences. There are good consequences and bad consequences. You will reap what you sow. I tell you, the lie the devil fabricated about freedom has even decimated lives before the fall of Adam. When Beelzebub was one of the angels of light, he fell into the sin of pride, exalting himself worthy of worship like unto God. At that time, Lucifer enlisted one-third of God's angels to join him. He convinced them they had the freedom to do this, and they were all cast out of heaven. Freedom is not the opportunity to do what you want. Freedom is the ability to do as you ought. I tend to favor the word ought because it implies there is a sense of duty, a sense of right and wrong, a reminder of ethics and morals. This means that even if we don't want to do something, we are still obligated to do it. I take this to be an elementary life lesson, common knowledge, but it seems like people in this wicked and perverse generation see that concept as foreign. They only want to find pleasure and do what they want to do. That's not how life works. That will only lead you to a life of misery. Look at all the celebrities and wealthy so socialites of our day who commit suicide because they see life as pointless and can't forgive themselves for their mistakes. In Matthew chapter 16 verses 24 through 27, Jesus told the disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and will then repay each one according to his deeds. I have good news for you, insomniacs. There is power in prayer and reading scripture for you, too. Can't sleep? Pray. That's what the disciples did. When Jesus went to the Mount of Olives to pray, just, before, just prior to his betrayal by Judas, he told the disciples to stay behind and pray. When the Lord came back to them, they were fast asleep, and this was at the climax of human history. When Jesus was in such fervent prayer that he was sweating blood. If you cannot sleep, my ultimate suggestion is prayer and study of the scriptures. The tempter does not want you to pray or learn about God. If he can't find some other way to distract you, he will put you to sleep. Even if it doesn't work, I see it as a win-win situation. If you're able to sleep, you will get physical rest for the body. If you cannot sleep, but you are able to pray and read the word, then you are providing rest in your spirit, comfort for the soul, strengthening yourself in the Lord, receiving the light and life of Christ into yourself. Now that is always a worthwhile and refreshing experience. When we pray, we shouldn't just throw shotgun prayers into the air and expect a miracle to fall from one of them. The Bible shows that there is more or less a method to prayer, a way to approach it. It's not about us. Yes, God cares for us, and he attends to our needs in his wisdom and power. And there is certainly a time 
and a command to ask for healing, so on and so forth. But if we just consistently focus on ourselves and our personal requests, the best way I can put this is, how would you feel if you were in a relationship and your partner only cared about their own problems, came to you when they needed something, or would come dump all of their emotional baggage at your feet, then wander off and go back to doing their own thing. Now hold on. I did not ask for a show of hands. I'm not asking how many of you have lived that experience. I'm asking how it would feel. We ought to pray with the Lord and His will as the reason. We have concerns that are ever present before us, but God already knows our petitions before we even start to intercede. We ought to come before the Lord with praise, thanking Him for what He has done, proclaiming Him as holy, revering Him as our King, determining that He is our Master. We ought to seek His good, pleasing, and perfect will above all else, above our own will, and above the opinions and persecution of those around us. We must declare him as ruler of all creation, with heaven his throne and the earth his footstool. Then we should come before him asking for that which is our need, as we also ask forgiveness for our transgressions. Repentance is not just a simple, singular action. It's a way of life, where we abhor the things that would endeavor to drive us away from God, and choose to make Christ and Him crucified our only obsession. At the same time, we must remember to forgive those that sin against us. If we expect to be saved, this is not a suggestion. It is a command. God will deal with our persecutors in his own way, which would not be in our way. Vengeance is not ours, but belongs to the Lord. We have a task at hand. We have a purpose. We have a race to run. We have fruit to bear. We have a field to plant before the time of harvest comes at hand. The very prayer that God gave man in the New Testament went through those very issues. Just think about this. God spelled prayer out so that you'd have an example. I appreciate that. Because if there's a way to get things messed up, I'll probably be the first one to say, if I'm doing it in my own flesh, I'll probably mess it up most all the time. In and of myself, I'm pretty reliable for making a mess of things. In Luke chapter 11, one of the disciples came to Jesus and asked for guidance on how to pray. In Matthew 6, Jesus was teaching on how our righteous actions and good works ought to be done when he gave the following prayer. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is the prayer Jesus gave not only to the disciples, but he gave it knowing that it would be recorded for you and I to read for an example. It is commonly known as the Lord's Prayer. Another prayer that we need to excavate from the Word is the prayer God gave the Israelites back in the Old Testament. 
This is the other prayer that God gave man. It's found in Numbers chapter 6, where God explained the process of making a Nazarite vow. The Aaronic blessing is as follows. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now, that being said, you will find other prayers in the Bible as well, for examples, and just as is written in 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Throughout the scripture, you'll find powerful prayers. You can read the prayers that Elijah prayed when fire was called down from heaven. You can read the prayers Jesus himself prayed when he was in the garden or when he performed miracles. You can read the prayer of Peter when he healed the lame man at the gate called Beautiful. You can also read the prayers of the other apostles, the patriarchs, and the prophets. We have a treasury of prayer right at our fingertips. You can't give a good overview of prayer unless you talk about praying in tongues. Well, I suppose you could, but then you'd be missing out on a big part of it. Praying in tongues is the initial physical evidence that one has been baptized with the Holy Spirit. This is a work that only a saved person can do, and it is the gift of God. It was taught by Jesus, Peter, Paul, and pretty much all of the early church. It wasn't just for the initial apostles, for the disciples. When you go through the New Testament, you can see that when salvation came to those in the early church, just regular church members, ordinary church members, they would also receive afterwards the infilling, indwelling of the Holy Spirit with the initial physical evidence of speaking in tongues. I encourage you to read the following scriptures. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 5. Acts chapter 2, verse 4. Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 46. Acts chapter 11, verses 15 through 17. Acts chapter 19, verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 39. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 29. Isaiah chapter 28, verses 11 through 12. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. Acts chapter 19, verses 2 through 6. Jude, verse 20. And pretty much all of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. As you can see from the list of scriptures, I can't give a thorough exposition on tongues or we would be here all night long. I will say that it is very much in use today and that it does have a practical application for believers. For further information on speaking in tongues, you can look up information through Andrew Womack Ministries as well as Jimmy Swaggart Ministries. You may also Google the Azusa Street Revival, as well as the birth of the Pentecostal Holiness and Assembly of God churches. The final subject on prayer I'm going to mention tonight is praise as a prayer. Sometimes we just need to let loose with a song. That's all right, as long as it's the right song. There is power in words, and there is power in music. If you're constantly listening to depressing music, don't be surprised if you end up depressed. If you listen to vulgar music that talks about violence and hatred, don't be surprised 
if you start feeling mean and ornery. I believe that as Christians living lives sanctified unto God, we ought to listen to music and make music that lifts up the name of Jesus, that soothes the soul. We ought to use the power of music for the purpose of the kingdom of God. There are some excellent worship tunes out there that can really touch you and help you worship the Lord. A lot of the older hymns were simply poems about the Lord that were later set to music. Music can lift your mood when you wake up. Music can change your outlook when you're in a grumpy mood. For the mature Christian, music can be used as a reminder that we have some authority over our emotions and we can turn the rudder in order to change our direction. I encourage you to find some good worship music, look up the lyrics, see if the song is scriptural, and if it is, put it on your go-to playlist. I think between all the different forms of prayer I've listed here, you should have a nice little overview on the general concept of prayer. I will say this. To more fully understand prayer, you really need to search the scriptures. The 66 books of the Bible are sufficient. The apostles didn't even have that. They only had the Old Testament to work with, but the main difference is they were also in the presence of the living word, Jesus Christ. I encourage you to seek that same presence. Instead of just seeking the Lord's hands and what he can give you, seek his face. Then you'll be on your way to doing what he has called you to do as he reveals things to you that professors and seminaries could never even touch. He can also take away desires that are hindering you so that you're more prepared to do the work you're destined for. In light of your walk with Christ, I highly recommend that you create a diary dedicated to the things God does in your life, whether it be answered prayers, things that just worked out perfectly orchestrated, anything where you could clearly see the hand of God at work. As always, I exhort you to pray and read the Bible.